Uh, my name is Yahya Raad, President of SPE University of Baghdad Chapter. And today I want to give you a warm welcome to all our friends and followers from the University of Baghdad and other chapters of the International Society of Petroleum Engineers. Uh, one thing I want you to note that when we finish this event, we'll have a competition based on what you have learned during the event. Now let's get on the details of the fourth lecture today with the speaker, Aman Srivastava, we, where he is going to dive into the digital transformation of drilling industry and the importance of adapting the digital technologies. Uh, about the lecturers, he is a Bachelor of Technology, Mechanical Engineering, 2008, and he, he also has Master of Science Petroleum Engineering from University of Oklahoma in 2014. He has also more than 14 years of experience in oil and gas industry. From the position he had already been in is a product owner, Holly Porton Landmark, USA March 2019, leading a team of developers to create cloud solutions for well planning, standardization, and automation. Drilling Engineer, Betrotel Incorporation, USA, May 2014 to March 2019. Supervise, monitor, and provide managerial and engineering support for all the rig and downhole operations in Oman. He also has a technical advisor, construction, technical reviewer positions, deputy editor in chief for the way ahead magazine technical reviewer of SPE drilling and completion. Also from his awards and achievements are SPE regional manager in 2023, the way ahead of the standing editor uh, award in 2020, SPE drilling and completion 2019 and technical reviewer awards. Uh, Mr. Aman Sirvastava, I'd like to welcome you again with us today and feel free to start the lecture when you are ready. Thank you, uh, yeah, yeah, for that warm welcome. Uh, I appreciate you reading that out for everyone. Uh, all right, I'm gonna share my screen and just confirm if you all can see the screen. Yes, yes. it's clear. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna stop the video just in case uh, to increase the bandwidth. <clears throat> and there is some glitch in my video camera today, so my screen is going in and out. Um, Right, so I'm turning off my video. And uh, if you have any questions, by the way, in the middle, uh, you can stop me in the middle and ask me that question if you want, or uh, I think I'm having an echo. Uh, uh, can someone, yeah, thank you. Uh, or you can post the question in the chat. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't, uh, I cannot read uh, Arabic or uh, I think language, I think that's Arabic, what's written in the there in the chat. So if you can post your questions in English, I would really appreciate it. Uh, I'm not as smart as you guys are. So uh, I only find my language and I'm good in English. Uh, all right. So uh, today we are going to talk about uh, digital transformation, drilling, and I'll be kind of focusing on drilling problems and what, what can be the digital lookout of looking at drilling engineering. I'm mostly a drilling engineer, as uh, Yaya mentioned, I've made majority of my experience is related to drilling engineering. So I'll be focusing on drilling aspects. Um, in, in, in the middle of this presentation, in, in this entire flow of webinar, I will be asking a few questions as well in the middle. And uh, you all can speak up if you want, but I know in webinar situations, it becomes very chaotic if many people try to speak up. So you all are more than welcome to put your opinion in the chat and I would love to read them out and uh, see what you have to say. <clears throat> All right, so um, I'll start with the quote by Jeff Bezos. Everybody knew, knows who Jeff Bezos is from Amazon. Uh, there is no alternative to digital transformation. Visionary companies will carve out new strategic options for themselves. Those that don't adapt will fail. So there is no other alternative for us to go digital, but what does going digital mean? So this is my first question to all of you that what do you think 
going digital mean for you as a person? What do you think? Take any example, banking sector or drilling engineering or your daily school life, your college life. What does going digital mean to you? I'll give you a few seconds here to write your answers in the chat and I would love to read them out uh, as you're going about. So again, the question is, what does digital mean? And I'm here referring to all of you as a person and you can come up with more answers, more than one answers. That's, there is no restriction in there. So feel free to write uh, in the chat box or if you want to speak up, somebody wants to speak up, I'm, you're more than welcome to. Automating a process uh, from Mr. Mark. Yes, excellent point. Automating a process, going digital means automating a process. Any other thoughts? <laughs> Getting the job done accurately, excluding the human errors. Excellent point, Abdullah. Getting the job done accurately and avoiding human errors. You know, typing, avoiding the typing again and again. Make everything easy, simple, and fast by a machine. Excellent point. We need a machine, and that's a very good uh, takeover there, that you need to make things easy and simple and fast by a machine. So there should be a machine working in the back end. Uh, excellent points. Uh, any other, I'll give you maybe a few more seconds over there to uh, maybe if somebody wants, else wants to chime in. All right, while you're typing, I'm just going to write in a few things that I could think of. And again, they, they are, they'll, they'll collide with what you are thinking right now. I'm pretty sure or what Mr. Mark, Mr. Abdullah, Mr. Ali Musa has written here. So, uh, Digital can mean software, excellent point. Uh, saving time leads to meaningful data. It should be a driver for change. You are going digital because you want to bring about a change. Mobility, I should be able to access that on my cell phone, my iPad, wherever I'm going. Uh, safety and security, very important. I mean, we all can imagine this. I mean, the data is everything nowadays. So that security of the data is important. Uh, helps in simulating scale or scenarios. Uh, you all have, you all are probably using these softwares in your uh, college daily life, CMG, Eclipse. Uh, we do projects, even normal Excel. You can have a simple reservoir simulation in an Excel and the whole idea of doing this simulation is you can scale it up to as much as you want. So you don't really have to, uh, you know, create a 1 million by 1 million grid. You can create a smaller grid, see how it will expand out. Uh, create value for business and client. It should create value. By the end, it's all about money. And it helps at foundational level. Automation. Uh, Mr. Mark, you already said that. That was the first point. Mine is the last point. So there are many such answers. That's why I have this dot, dot, dot in the end. There are many answers to what going digital can mean. And let's look at what digital drilling should mean to, to us. Drilling industry has three major aspects. One is the planning. Second is the execution. And third is the feedback that comes back to planning. So it's kind of like a life cycle for every well that is planned by a drilling engineer, planned and uh, drilled. So we st the, the drilling industry aspects, if I look into planning, you start with some subsurface data, some surface data, you know, what are your targets? What are the lithology that you're going to drill through? What will be the trajectory? What angle will you turn? What will be the dog leg severity? what kind of directional drilling aspect you will be considering. Uh, what is the casing policy? That would be heavily dependent on the pore pressure, fracture pressure data. That again is the subsurface data. You take into consideration casing policy and henceforth you move on to casing design. I'm sure you must have studied in your petroleum engineering courses somewhere how to do a casing design. Uh, you can again digitize that process. Of course, you can do it on a piece of paper, but Digitizing it means you can make it repetitive. You can do it faster without human errors. Uh, you further on move on to designing cementing, BHA designing, torque and drag analysis, hydraulics analysis, string and BHA dynamics, swab and surge analysis. There's a whole bunch of engineering tools you use in order to perform these calculations. Uh, once all these calculations are done and a drilling engineer is confident that my planning is good. They move on to execution and kind of all of these things, subsurface, surface, trajectory, directional drilling, casing policy, casing design, cementing, BHA design, everything is repeated again in execution because you're now getting live data. You're getting live information from the rig side 
and you can compare how good my planning was versus what I executed. And that is where you create rig reports, lessons learned report, real-time monitoring, which eventually lead back to a feedback going to the planning again. So the, the lessons that you learned from your drilling experience of actually drilling the well, that data becomes important because you take it back to your planning execution phase. Now, before I dive into uh, how digitization is changing or can change drilling industry, I want to just give you in perspective an example outside the drilling industry, something which is more generalized, which is for everyone they can understand easily uh, in marketing channels. Uh, marketing has in, in MBA, marketing is a big thing. Uh, marketing can change the face of any brand or any company that you're looking at. Uh, if you look at traditional marketing channels on the left hand side, we we had we still have print materials. You know, in uh, you have in newspapers, you put printable ads, you have brochures, mail campaigns. These mail campaigns sent out get sent out to your home as coupons. You have billboard advertising, still a big way. You print out huge posters of billboard and you post them on huge screens. Uh, brick and mortar storefront, which means you literally have a shop where you go and buy stuff or people can come and look at your uh, product that you're selling. And finally, you have loyalty club card. This is not applicable to every shop, but many shops or many big uh, uh, shop uh, chains, they have this loyalty club card. Now, applying digitization to marketing can save huge amount of money and time for people, especially on the, the people who are doing the marketing. So for example, print materials can be replaced with digital materials, and it helps in reducing the amount of money you are spending on papers, the distribution, the mailing, all that goes away. Instead of mailing those print campaigns or brochures, you can email them. And again, you save huge amount of money in sending uh, sending a postcard, sending a post postal message, just send an email and it goes for free. Social media advertising. Instead of a billboard, many times, or not many times, there are so many companies who don't even go for billboard advertising. They straightforward go with social media advertising. Facebook, YouTube, they are filled with ads and that's how they make money and that's how they, 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 they attract customers. They, they can be very selective and it can be personalized targeting. I mean, I, I know that I was talking to my wife a few days back about a bag that I wanted to buy. And suddenly my Facebook started showing me these ads of bags. And I, I was like, how did the phone know that I am talking to my wife about some bags? So the phone is listening. They can do a very personalized marketing campaign here with, with us. A brick and mortar storefront, you don't need that. If Amazon. Uh, uh, Flipkart, uh, eBay, they don't have a shop to go for. You can, you just buy it from Amazon and the Amazon uh, warehouse ships it to your home. That's how Amazon works. There is no brick and mortar storefront. And loyalty club cards are replaced with mobile apps and mobile apps are common for everywhere. Like in Walmart, uh, you have a mobile app, you go there and you can get free coupons for uh, Walmart, Target, Kroger, Costco, you name it. And again, it reduces the amount of printing and whatnot. So this was just to give you a perspective that going digital is can, can change the whole way you're looking at one particular aspect of your life. So know your stuff. Remember these three words, and I'll come back to these three words again later on. I'll tell you why I wrote it here. But this is important from this point onwards in my uh, in my presentation. So know your stuff. This is important. Uh, digital transformation is not about technology. It is about people. I, I, I saw this quote somewhere online, and I think this is very apt. Many times we think that going digital means I need to use one software, I, or I need to use my iPhone, or I need to use my Android phone, or uh, it should be on my iPad. It's not about technology. It's not about can it get on your phone or not, or can it get on your iPad or not. It's about the people. The marketing channel that I just gave you an example for, in all those examples, there is not even a single example where it will say that we adopted this email campaign or we adopted this method because 
uh, we were going to use a cool technology over there. No, nobody cares about technology. Actually, it's about people. People you are going to target, people such as yourself as drilling engineers or petroleum engineers. So think about, about easing the life of, of that person and that's how you bring digital transformation in. Applying the technology, that's easy. That's the easy part. First of all, understand the problem statement of that person, of understand what is it that they want to uh, simplify in their life. Now, drilling engineering, uh, we've been drilling for oil and gas for more than a century now. And I think uh, I can call like maybe in like 1920s and 30s, that's when it started getting a little bit more organized, where they were drilling rigs, properly structured drilling rigs, and we were drilling deeper well. So more than a century now. But I think maybe in 60s or 70s, somewhere during that time, someone might have said that I want to have a smarter real-time drilling experience. What does it mean? I mean, um, you go on a rig site uh, in 70s, 60s, drilling rigs were mostly operated by uh, the, the drillers who were there, the drillers, the roughneck, they were mostly just uh, truck drivers or not very educated folks. They, 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 they used to just work off of their instinct. Uh, they have a few gauges in front of them. They look at the weight, they look at the pressure and they decide what they need to do next. The, the, most, uh, the most educated person on the rig site used to be a geologist or a mud engineer, and that's it. Uh, but I'm sure at some point of time, some driller must have said, hey, I want to have a smarter drilling, real-time drilling experience. So let's look at what a driller, so if you put yourself in that state of mind and think that, all right, a driller is asking me a question that how can I make this real-time drilling experience a little bit more you know, uh, snappy? So you look at the drilling operation and you see that there are, I mean, there is, there's so much data coming into it. You see weight on bed, hook load, pressure, that's the pump pressure, pump speed, torque, RPM hook position. Now, obviously, there are so many more uh, points of data that are coming in. You have pit tank, pit volume, flow returns, percentage, gas amount that's coming in. Uh, but I'm focusing on these seven because these seven are the most basic, uh, most basic uh, data points that are needed to drill a well. Now, let's look at the evolution, what happened here. And we'll try to look at these examples and try to build on top of it that how we can improve our understanding of digitization and how it impacts drilling industry. So we started off with analog sensors. And if in slowly around maybe, maybe I would say like 50s, 60s, slowly we started shifting towards digital sensors. Now, somewhere between analog sensors and digital sensors, there was a technology that was invented. And if you have <clears throat> a professor or a senior person you can speak to who has spent several years in drilling, um, they can tell you there was a device called a seven pen recorder at that time. And this was like the pinnacle of technology during that time. And what it did was it took data from seven locations and that was primarily weight on bed hook load pressure pump speed so primarily these seven points and it used to just record them with respect to time on a piece of paper so like seven wiggly lines would come on a piece of paper now that was a huge achievement because now you are not only looking at the live data the real-time data of in analog sensor or digital sensor, but you can go back in time and look at what happened to that data. Was there a trend I can look at? Was the pressure declining continuously or the weight on weight increasing continuously or, or any, any such situation? So we went into seven pen recorder and slowly when all the sensors became digital in nature, we are able to get all the data electronically. We move to real time thank you so much so um once we got all the sensors digitized we moved on to real time screens so what are these real time screens real time screens again take the data from this digital sensor and plot it on your computer screen. So big deal, seven pen recorder was doing the same thing. The advantage of real-time screen was 
first of all, you can have many more sensors, not just restricted to seven. You don't need to worry about the pens going out of thing or the paper getting meshed, messed up. You're getting the data, it's getting recorded in history in your, in your computer's database forever. So you can have it in any way you want. The software that was built in order to read this digital sensor, they can provide you option to look at the data time-based or depth-based. And I'll show you in a while how that impacted, how that changed the way you look at these screens, how they change, they change the way you look at the data. Now, once you have this real-time data getting loaded on your rig site, you can transmit that data to your office or to any other remote location. And that also is a big deal because now I can sit in the office or I can be like thousands of miles away from that location. I can still see live in real time what is going on on the rig site. Of course, I can talk to them. I can talk on the phone and stuff like that. But um, I can transmit that data and that's a huge potential. Now, yeah. Hello. Okay, I think there is some... some uh, can we mute that? I've got the reading of technology. I'm sorry, was that a question? Okay, maybe that was an echo. All right. So um, now we are at a stage where we are looking at real time intelligence. Hello. So we're at a stage we're looking at not just transmitting the real-time data, but also intelligence and artificial intelligence and machine learning forecasting. And that's where I will be jumping on to from my next slide. So we are at now, right now at this stage somewhere here. We have achieved real-time data transmission and we are moving into real-time intelligence. We are bringing intelligent information. We are, we are trying to understand how we can improve our real-time understanding of drilling and then simultaneously apl apply machine learning forecasting. So let us look at some scenarios here. All right, so here what I'm gonna do is, I will be giving you some scenarios that you are observing this. Imagine yourself at a drilling rig site. And I will give you one scenario, which is just one real time observation. And then I'll give you an understanding of trend. Now, whenever you look at a trend, it would mean obviously that you're looking at a digitized format of that data. So for example, I'll, I'll take the first one here. Uh, scenario one, observation with or without digitization, which means you're just looking at a sensor. You're looking at one, uh, just one place at, at your uh, pressure gauge or your hook load gauge. So you see a, a sudden reduction in hook load. And then you see a sudden drop in pump pressure and increase in the pump rate. Now, this is something you observed instantly at that very instant. There was no, you don't have any history what's going on. You are just looking at a pressure gauge. Now let's look at second scenario. You brought in some digitization and what is the value added to it? The intelligence that comes with digitization is you see a trend of declining pump pressure. Now, this is a big thing. You just, you are not just seeing a sudden reduction in hook load or sudden drop in pump pressure, but you can see a trend that your pump pressure is declining slowly. Now, what does that mean? What can it mean? What can it? What kind of di drilling problem you may encounter because of this? And I'll take the first one, like I said. So the answer is it's a mud cut string, which means that when you tightened your joints on the rig floor, they were not tight enough. And the mud, when you were pumping through the drill string, it was seeping out of those of that small joint failure. And by the end, what was happening is slowly, the string was getting the thread connection was getting cut out. That's why you were seeing a decline in pump pressure. And eventually what happened was the string parted. So as soon as the string parted, you suddenly have a pump pressure which goes down because you're not pumping through the bit anymore and you have an increase in pump rate. So. Now, if you just looked at the first one without any digitization, you know, just looking at an analog or a digital sensor, there is not much intelligence or anything you can do in this situation, like you have lost the string already, it's gone. But by bringing some digitization, looking at a trend of declining pump pressure, 
you maybe can predict or forecast that, hey, something is not right. I see a continuous decline in pump pressure. This doesn't make any sense. Why am I seeing a declining pump pressure? Finally, the AIML forecasting, if I apply machine learning forecasting, and this is where nowadays people are moving on to, is the computer registers a decrease in pump pressure trend through machine learning algorithm and suggests pull out of hole to check for mud cut. So if you can train a computer through machine learning, you can tell that, hey, this kind of decline in pump pressure means that there is something wrong and you need to pull out of hole the computer can identify that decline in pump pressure immediately and tell you, hey, something is not right. This doesn't make sense. So this is how AI ML forecasting can be achieved. Now, again, I'm repeating the quote I said earlier, digital transformation is about people, not technology. It doesn't matter how you are bringing this intelligence. It doesn't matter uh, whether you're transferring the data using WITSML format or any other format. It doesn't matter what kind of machine learning algorithm you are using here. All it matters that uh, you are able to bring some intelligence and sense into what you are doing as a drilling engineer or how you're helping out the driller. So I'll give you another situation here. And I want all of you to See, I want to see if you all can, if you all can contribute towards uh, it in the chat. So I'll give you some scenarios. I'll give you some time to, to type in there. Okay. So the scenario is you observe on the rig site that slowly the tanks, the, the uh, mud tanks are getting lower in volume. The amount of mud you have is going down. The returns are very low. Even when you are pumping, you are, you're not getting enough returns on your shale shaker. And your pump pressure is fluctuating. It's going up and down. It's not very smooth. All right. So you see, this is a one-time uh, instance observation you see here. Now, as a trend, you will see a, a trend of declining pump pressure. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, uh, the meaning of AI ML is artificial intelligence or machine learning. So AI is artificial intelligence and ML is machine learning and very hot topic nowadays for everyone to learn. Uh, I myself, I'm learning these things as I'm going ahead. So AI is artificial intelligence, ML is machine learning. All right, coming back to the problem statement, you see a trend of declining pump pressure and you see a trend of declining pit volume. And I think Mr. Abdullah, you, you got the right answer. It's a loss situation. You're losing mud into a zone you you are in a loss circulation zone now uh, you you this is an ob these both of these observations here are kind of like you are seeing as you are walking or you can see it in your trend in your uh, pit volume uh, indicator in your trend analysis but how can artificial intelligence or machine learning uh, help there we have losses so check how much static loss <laughs> excellent point uh, Mr. Riyadh here, you need to check for static losses and dynamic losses. Uh, the AIML forecasting can identify these trend of declining pump pressure and declining pit volume much faster than what a human eye can detect or probably even a sensor level can detect. So they can identify that you are you are losing some mud. It doesn't feel it doesn't feel like you're getting proper returns here. Another thing. AI and ML can actually help you identify that you are going to reach this zone and they can perform an offset well analysis and tell you that, hey, you are about to reach this zone. So make sure that you have loss circulation materials ready beforehand. Exactly, Mr. Abdullah. A trend may help us fix the issue faster. You have, you, you, you bag the nail in the head. Uh, if you know, if you can identify the issue faster, you can fix it faster. If I can identify that I am losing mud, even before I have entered deep into the loss circulation zone, I can pump in LCM materials immediately and prevent these losses and prevent a huge loss of money. And that's where this, uh, this uh, implementation of digitization comes in handy. You can identify these issues faster. Again, keep this in mind. It's not about technology. It's about people. It's about your problem as a drilling engineer. You don't want to enter a zone 
of loss zone without being ready. All right, let's look at a third scenario. Uh, you suddenly see that the drilling has slowed down. Whatever rate you were drilling on, it has gone down. You don't have a proper trend chart, but you have a feeling that you are drilling slower. Uh, second comes in, you have erratic torque and RPM. Your torque is suddenly going higher and lower. And the observation you see on the shale shaker is you have a sticky clay on the shale shaker. Now, if you were looking at this on, on, on a digitized uh, rig sensing machine, uh, you would be seeing a decreasing ROP trend. So you can see that clearly the rate of penetration has gone down. You're drilling slower. You can see erratic torque, which means you can see a lot of squiggly lines on the uh, on uh, on the torque uh, aspect, and you can see a slight increase in pump pressure. Uh, Mr. Ayman, let me. Uh, so, Bitware, uh, Mr. Ayaya, you are very close to getting to that point. Bitware, that's a good point, but actually the answer is you are getting a stick step condition. So, kind of related to Bitware, but actually your bit has entered into a sticky clay situation. There is a clay which is extremely st sticky, and that's why your bit is sticking to it and then slipping through it. So you have a stick slip situation. Now, one aspect of looking at it is AIML can again identify immediately, even before you see the shale cutting, sticky clay cuttings on your shale shaker, it can identify that, hey, you are getting an erratic torque. So it can tell you that something not right. Maybe it's a stick slip condition. And the algorithm again can forecast that you are about to enter a sticky clay condition, you might want to have those chemicals ready beforehand. Instead of fighting the sticky clay, you will be ready all, all together with your mud. So that's how you can improve the performance of your drilling. Run soft talk to minimize high stick clip. Uh, bang on, uh, you need to run soft talk. Actually in some conditions, sometimes uh, even if you want to run, well, well when you say soft talk, uh, you can have a softer torque by reducing the RPM, having more jetting condition. But the problem with stick slip is that you might be able to get through that sticky clay formation, but the bit will still get balled up. And for that, you will need to use some chemicals. Uh, I mean, primarily we call them detergents. You put some detergent and it will help clean up the bit. It, the, the sticky clay will go away. So if you have these chemicals beforehand, you're done. You're good to go. Uh, I think the let me read your question here. Sorry, but the problem in my point of view will be with the supervised data and how you will collect different trends for each problem. It's not static. So excellent point, Mr. Ahmed. And I will be addressing this. Just I have one last condition I want to show you and I will be address, addressing this thing here. So let's look at the last scenario. And Mr. Ahmed, I will come to your question again. So, uh, an observation, I think you all would be uh, interested in looking at this. Uh, you see a drilling break. A drilling break means suddenly your drilling speed has increased. All of a sudden you are drilling extremely fast. Uh, you have a low pump pressure. You're pumping at a very low pressure. You have a very high pump rate and the mud engineer or the direct man is reporting that your shale shaker is overflowing. Uh, Mr. Abdullah, you already guessed it. It's again, you have an influx. Now. This is where actually this what I'm what I'm saying is what I'm showing you here a sudden gradual increase in ROP decrease in pressure trend increase in pump rate trend overflowing shale shaker video observe increase in pit volume uh, we already have certain technologies or certain algorithms which are able to identify these conditions much in a much premature state than a human can. So they can identify that there is a decrease in pump pressure. They can identify that there is a slowly increase in the okay. ROP. They can identify that there is a gain in your pit volume much more accurately, much more faster than a human eye can detect. And this is where we are actually using these technologies to prevent very dangerous accidents that can lead from influx because if it's a gas influx, we need to be careful. Now, uh, a lot of work is going on right now in, in building these AI ML algorithms where these algorithms can identify preemptively what, uh, what can lead to an influx, how can influx be avoided. And again, you read the offset data and the algorithm can tell you that, hey, 
in the neighboring well we got this situation at so and so depth so you need to be careful in this well again you might want to increase your mud weight now coming to the part of uh, how the real time data looks like all this time i was talking about real time data real time data we are looking at these lines this is what a real time data looks like and now i'm sharing something which is uh, which is uh, open source because this data is very uh, secure for every company. So I'm showing you something which is open source. Now, what you see here is actually just a bunch of squiggly lines. That's all you see and you have to make sense out of it. What these squiggly line means. Now, this is a trend. Uh, this is a trend of various packet on bit, drill string, RPM, torque, uh, and so many other parameters with respect to time. So you can see what happened at what state of time. But uh, the problem is sometimes this can become very erratic. As you can see, there's so much fluctuation in torque and weight on weight. And you would think that, hey, like, is that a fluctuation of torque am I looking at? But actually, no, because there is a fluctuation of torque all the time. Now, if you look at depth-based chart, it becomes a little bit more uh, sorted because it's you get one value of torque or one value of uh, weight on weight for every piece of depth. Now, here you can see there are, you can put markers for pump of gas, uh, what kind of connection gas, what kind of swap gas. Now, let me come to the question that Mr. Ahmed, you said, and uh, there was a question recently by Mr. or Ms. A, uh, the forecasting of AIML, is it always right? Is there, a, is there any possibility to get wrong? There is a very good possibility of getting it wrong. And Mr. Ahmed said the right thing here, that the problem is always with the supervised data and how will you collect different trends for each problem? And this is, uh, I myself have been involved with some uh, research that was going on in my company with respect to this AIML. Now, what happens in these situations is uh, we have data science engineers, you can call them data science engineers. So this data science engineer has usually a degree in computer computer science or, or any certain field, they're not petroleum engineers. Now, they know so many different kinds of algorithms. I mean, you might have already heard this. A very basic form of forecasting is regression analysis, right? We identify the trend, we make an equation out of it, and then we do a regression. Uh, it could be linear regression, non-linear regression, it depends, and then we slowly move on to identifying the trend, random forest methods. You can apply neural networks, there is no limit to how many kinds of analysis you can perform. But the problem is this thing, this analysis is called as data science. Data comes first. The first word itself is data. If we don't have data, where would you put the science in? So you first need the data. Data means good data. So as a drilling engineer, as a petroleum engineer, you all are a very important piece in that cog, in that machine. You're a very important piece in that in, in that area where you need to tell what is a good data, what is a bad data. And Mr. Ahmed, what you said there, supervised data, your model of AIML, your machine learning model, will only be as good as the data that you have given it is. It's just like saying you're training a little kid in whatever, uh, mathematics, you're telling him to do ed him or her to do addition, the kid would be only as smart as the amount of complex problems you have told the kid to do. If you just told the kid always that two plus two is four, two plus two is four, when someone asks the kid what is 24 plus 48, the kid has no, had, has no clue, how do I do this? Because the kid has never seen such complex problem. They, the kid has always seen a simple problem. And that's exactly what these AI ML algorithms lead to. So it's this is a big, uh, I would say it's a big hole in the petroleum industry that we are not able to generate good data, actual data. I'm not talking about fabricated data. Don't think that you can fabricate a data to tell the machine learning algorithm that this is how you get an influx. If you do that, your trend analysis is so perfect that machine learning will never be able to identify that because it's so perfect because it was made of data. You, you drafted that data out of thin air. So this kind of uh, 
excellent point. Do the noises and uncertainties with the train data affect model to be wrong as I mentioned other challenge with the benchmark process? Excellent point, Mr. Ahmed. So yes, actually these noises and uncertainties with the trained data affect the model and you can train your model when to ignore these noises and when not to ignore these noises. And I've done that myself. So for example, I'll tell you one of the examples I was doing. We were looking at weight on Now, at one point of time, the weight on bit that we were receiving, the numbers were like very nicely mentioned, you know, where 25 kips, 24 kips, 25 kips, 26 kips, 27 kips, 24 kips. So you're getting a nice analysis, a little bit of squiggly line. You know what I'm going to draw? I can, I can draw as good as, as you have trained it. I mean, a kid will eventually find out to some 24 plus 48, but, a mush, but an artificial intelligence will never be able to find that out because it's artificial. And that's where you need to keep on reinforcing it, keep on telling it that this is how you learn and understand and adapt to changes. And that is what is important in AI ML application. Now, I know my, my, my presentation has gone suddenly from digitization to AI or ML application, but I'm glad you asked these questions because that's where I'm seeing that you are, you guys are challenging that what is the better way to do it? I, I don't know, I'm not a data science guy, but that's the best part. I am the guy who knows the data, or I would say here, let's not throw the eye. You are the people who know the data. You know what 24 kips weight on bit mean and what minus nine, four, five, six weight on bit means. You are the one who knows what should be the right torque value, what should not be the right torque value. You are the people who understand it. You need to be there. You need to understand what is the problem am I resolving? I'm, I'm trying to build a AI ML algorithm to identify stuck pipe situation. Okay, let's take that into consideration. What should be the parameters that, uh, uh, that you should be looking at? Should you be looking at mud tank volume? Is that a very important aspect to look at when you are analyzing for a stuck pipe? Probably not. Should you be looking at the number of people on the rig site? No, not probably not. So there are many ways, data is data, anything is data coming off of the rig site, but it's you guys. So that's why I'm going back to my thing. Uh, look at hook load to know, <laughs> excellent point, Mr. Riyadh. But the problem here is if you look at the hook load, it will tell you, you are a stuck pipe situation. Can you build a model which can forecast, hey, you are about to get into a tight pull situation. Can you do that? And that's the challenge here is. That is the benefit of digitalization. So think about that. Yes, you said it right. Look at the hook load to know. But let's go one step further. How can I how can I tell the machine, tell me that, hey, you're about to enter into the situation? And that is where I'll go back to my slide here where I said, know your stuff. And this is important. That's why I mentioned know your stuff is extremely important for you guys. You don't need to know what ML algorithm is best, but you need to know what kind of data is important. Mr. Riyadh, what you just said, look at the hook load. You know that to look, look at the hook load. Data science, they will not know to look at the hook load. So, all right, I'm going to open up another, uh, and this is the last question I'm putting up in front of all of you. Uh, this is a problem statement. And trust me, I'm saying this because I also have been challenged for this uh, by my managers. Uh, the problem statement is all of you are petroleum engineers. You would eventually join some big company as drilling engineers, hopefully. And uh, the problem statement is the manager comes and tells you, I want to improve my drilling engineers planning performance. The way we plan, I'm not talking about execution. I'm not talking about when you actually go for drilling. I'm talking about, I want to improve my drilling engineers planning performance, how they plan the wells. Now, uh, there's a project. There are two to five drilling engineers in a project. Uh, there are trainings available. You can send drilling engineers for training. Of course, that will help a lot. All engineers have bachelor's or master's degree, just like you folks. So they're all, so you can assume like it's a good knowledgeable gentry who have a uh, good educational background. Uh, there are some developers available. Developer means software developers. So if you tell them that uh, I want to make this code, you can talk to them and they will develop it for you in Python or Excel or VB or whatever. 
and there are some drilling softwares you can purchase like landmark like drill pan there's so many other softwares available in the market uh what would be your approach and i'm opening this question to all of you uh when i say approach i'm asking all of you i'm challenging all of you ask me question i'm your manager i'm asking you uh uh what can we do working in squads and use azure devops methodology A excellent point mr ahmed actually to be honest i'm a product manager and i use azure devops methodology uh, we use agile process adio we use adio board in fact i was working on adio board right before this so working in squads excellent point so uh if i can challenge you a little bit more what do you mean squads Wh what kind of squads would you prepare <laughs> and the question is open to all of you you guys can uh, you guys can even ask me questions if you want if you think like you know counter questioning i have given you this problem statement you can come back and ask me questions if you if you think and place yourself in position where you are working in a company and yeah. your manager has come and told you that hey i want to improve my performance uh to be more precise i am planning a well it takes me two weeks to plan one well how can i plan a well in two days reduce the time from two weeks to two days how can i do that all right so maybe uh, i am dsv at wqnx of some point and we will use total ops and some sometimes mud logger okay excellent point um so we, we use drill ops and sometimes mud logger that's a that's a good that's a good point uh um uh, sriyad over here so you have mentioned that you use drill ops and that helps you plan the well and i'm sure it 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 serves faster in planning the well uh, uh if i can ask you now let me let me okay, let me let me challenge you um where is the data okay i want to plan a well planning a well you, you need to require data for well planning excellent point uh, here uh, mr mohammed uh, mr mohammed you need to know the required data for the well planning excellent yes we have the data okay i'm the manager i'm replying to you oh yeah yeah, yeah. we have uh, the required data which means uh, we have the wells that were planned you know up until last year all of these wells planned are in the next room room number whatever 1 2 3 4 uh, go in there and you will find all the shelves lined up with files where you can take any file out check it out and you will see everything related to that well in that file and when i'm saying file i mean literally a printed file not a digital file everything is available in printed format do you think that's a very good way to start your planning process do you think this kind of data acquisition will help you in planning better wells no for sure excellent point no for sure cuz you will never enter that room it will be dusty it will be hard for you to find the well it will be very hard for you to cross reference the well but you need to go in that room because what you need to do is you will say all right boss data driven insights and build dashboards so excellent point data driven insights and build dashboards so for that data driven insights you first need the data and the data i told you is in that next room printed out in files so probably you will have to go in that room take the files one by one maybe from the recent wells most recent wells and then go backwards and start entering that information into some database so that you have the data so when you search wells with influx it gives you result back that these were the wells that had influx in them now see this is where the digitization comes into handy this this is where digitization can help you achieve your goal to improve your planning performance everything starts with data where is my data even if you do trail ops or mud logger where is the data are you typing it manually if you remember my first question over there was what is the meaning of digital and i think uh, someone wrote back that uh, excluding human errors if you are typing that data again and again manually you are very likely to end up to having a, a human error in there so this was just a 
uh, food for your thought. I'm, I, I'm not expecting a clear answer. I don't have a clear answer. I'm still working on this thing uh, in my daily life. So, uh, but these will be the kind of questions or challenges you will see when you go out in the industry as to how can improve your performance and try to think in terms of digitization, digitizing a particular aspect. And many times the digitization starts with the process of uh, getting the data. Thank you so much. All right. So uh, also see the offset wells to get lessons learned and improve. But excellent point, Mr. Riyad. That's again, the point is, <laughs> yeah, offset wells lessons learned are there. It's in that room printed in the file. So go and read it. <laughs> and that's like, people will get irritated. That, oh, I don't want to do that. So yeah, uh, whenever you think of any such problem statement in your life, always think that uh, digital transformation is about people. It's about the problems of people, not technology. It doesn't matter what technology you use. There are people in the world who are specializing in there. Uh, oh, there's so much. So I'll repeat what I said there. So um, Mr. Yad, what I what I'm saying here is that by the end, you will be encountering these problem statements in your daily life, and. Always think in terms of, first of all, how do I reduce this? Then move towards thinking that, hey, what if I had this data available with me in a digital format? And then move on to see or ask someone, how can I get this done faster in a digital format? Because if I can get that done in digital format, then I can solve a lot of problems. So always think of digital transformation about solving a problem, not because we are going to cloud because it's cooler. No, it's not. You probably will end up in a more loss if you just move to cloud because it's cooler. Anyway, uh, I'm going to leave you guys with one last thing where why idea is important, why knowing your stuff is important. Uh, I'll talk about GPS, uh, but it is cooler. <laughs> I agree, <laughs> going to cloud is cooler. All right, so uh, I've, I want to give you an example again outside the drilling industry, uh, just to give you a cross-referencing domain. So how does the GPS work? If you just Google it, there are satellites launched all over the earth. And at one point of time, any place you're on earth, you probably have three or four satellites, which are tracking the GPS that you are using and they uh, triangulate your position precisely. And um, I, I'm, I'm not talking about the, uh, uh, the thing in your phone, that's not GPS. That's just your cell networks telling you where you are. GPS communicates directly to the satellite. Now, when the GPS was built, uh, it was done by US Army. When the GPS was built, they turned it on. It was perfectly precise. Everyone was happy. The next day, they came in and they saw a 10 kilometer per day error in the GPS. Per day, which means today they were like almost 10 kilometers away. The next day, it was like 20 kilometers away. They had no idea what's going on. They checked everything. Everything was perfect. The satellite and the computers, everything was pinpointing in the right direction. But when you actually saw, okay, what is my location? It showed 10 kilometer away the next day, 20 kilometer away, and they had to restart every day. They didn't know what was happening. Now, someone who went deeper into the problem statement, that person figured out that the satellites are moving at a speed of 14,000 kilometers per hour. We are stationary holding the GPS device. So as per Einstein's special theory of relativity, the clocks are slowed down by seven microseconds per day. Satellites are farther away from Earth's gravity. We are closer to the center of the Earth. So we are closer to the, we are more into the Earth's gravitational dent. So general theory of relativity applies and it advances our clock by 38 or 45 microseconds per day, which means the net satellite clock is advancing by 38 microseconds per day. This leads to 10 kilometer per day error in GPS. This was something which was figured out few 
weeks or few months after they observe this problem of 10 km per day. Now, the guy who had built the GPS, he was or she was so much into building GPS that they could think of this problem statement. When Einstein made this theory of relativity, these two theories of relativity, Einstein had no idea that we will build GPS somewhere 50, 60 years down the lane and this equation will be used. Einstein just made those equations. We use those equations to help us. So now, every GPS on Earth has an atomic clock which deliberately advances by 38 microseconds per day to match with the satellite GPS or vice versa. You can do either way as you want. The problem is solved. So next time, whenever you are flying a plane, going on a ship, they all use GPS. So you need to thank that one person, I don't know who, that one person who figured out this problem and Mr. Albert Einstein, that he came up with this special theory of relativity and general theory of relativity. So you see, that's why knowing your stuff is important. The person who was building the GPS there, that person was so much into it that person knew each and every nut and bolt of GPS. That person knew everything in and out. And then that person said, okay, it is not the GPS that is having a problem. It is something else, something else that is affecting my calculations. It could be speed. It could be the gravity. And that's what it was. It was the speed of the satellite and it was the gravity of the earth that was affecting the GPS. So that's all I have for you guys for now. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm open to any questions. You can put in the chat or you can ask me if you want. Thank you, Mr. Srivastava, for sharing this knowledge with us. Uh, and uh, it was very inspiring. And it's actually the digital transformation of the drilling industry is an ongoing journey. And your expertise has shed valuable light on its importance. Uh, so everyone, if you have any question, you can uh, write it in the chat box or you can uh, unmute and speak to Mr. Srivastavas directly. Yeah, I'm open to that. Thanks a lot, Mr. Um, okay, so first of all, hello, can you hear me, yeah. sir? Yeah. Okay. First of all, I wanted to thank you very much for the great lecture and the light you shed on the points, and especially this last story for Mr. Einstein. And I believe <laughs> we all own him a lot now, even more than we know. So <laughs> I, I, I'm really sorry I didn't catch the lecture from the beginning. I missed the mm -hmm. part of it. But I, I was wondering. So the lecture was shedding light on the machine learning and. Uh, the technological advance into the drilling operations. Yeah. Uh, is there any new fields in the oil field that you are seeing that are uh, evolving with the machine learning and with the digital uh, area? Like for me, I've been working with the workover and ESP op operations for a long time, but it would be a great benefit for everyone to know if, if you know any new fields that are developing the same methods or uh, or uh, algorithms uh, in drilling or outside drilling uh, uh, drilling or outside it, it's, okay. it, it's specified in drilling it would be great I okay think. so in drilling industry uh, one thing i know a lot of people are focusing right now is uh, real time analysis as i was showing here so there are many companies who are working in order to analyze the real time data and apply machine learning and AI self-learning algorithms in order to identify the trends of problems. So that's something, and if I can be very more specific on real-time trends, I mean, stuck pipe situations, forecasting stuck pipe situations, um, forecasting uh, early kick detection. You can detect a kick or an influx much earlier than uh, your human eye can detect them. Uh, 
something that has uh, always stopped people from moving more into digitization is the text based information that is shared with everyone and when i say text based information in your ddr in your daily drilling report uh, we have a, a summary of whatever we did in the entire day and many times that summary has a lot of crucial information for example if you had a loss zone what chemical did you lose use in that loss zone to prevent that loss from happening and that information may may get lost because it's only in text based information it's not in any weight on weight it's not a number it's a text string exactly. so I analyzing I, I, I've been working. I, I myself, I've wrote mm -hmm. a number of DDRs, and I know this. This and there yeah. is no set format you can write. There's a set format. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Total end. And God help the amount of acronyms we use. You know, oh, P O H yeah. P O H P O H P O H. And you have no idea. And the end. I mean, there is just and no idea. Computer would have computer. It's not a John Grisham novel. You know, it's not a yeah. novel you're writing. Yeah, couldn't so, agree uh, But there is. Nowadays, the LLM model, I mean, you, I'm sure you all have must have heard of ChatGPT, Google Bard, uh, uh, Microsoft launched Copilot. So sure. this ChatGPT, this, this uses LLM modeling and LLM models help in reading these texts and identifying what it could mean and transfer it to. So uh, that's also a very big area of research going on currently, analyzing the text-based information right. and providing it in a structured format so that it can be used later on for lessons learned or feedback purposes. So that's also a very important aspect. Um, as far as the number goes, the numbers like real-time numbers, real-time data numbers that come in, uh, there are already many companies who are working towards analyzing it in a machine learning algorithm or, or uh, artificial intelligence-based algorithm or simply regression models or creating better alarms for the users and providing more mobility. So that's also a very, very uh, hot topic nowadays. Uh, analyzing the real-time analysis trends is helpful in other areas such as geothermal. Nowadays, geothermal drilling is going into a huge amount of, uh, 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 huge amount of interest all over the globe. And geothermal obviously means high pressure, high temperature conditions where the bitware, the mud, uh, conditions need to be monitored much more precisely. And that's where uh, maybe these trend analysis of data of how the mud temperature is changing, how the geothermal temperature is changing, that can help in better performance of geothermal drilling or geothermal wells. Well, that I couldn't thank you more. It's really clear. And the, you gave me a great idea with the chat GBT and LLM models. Actually, for the, that. It's fun. yeah, for sure, I will definitely try it. For our side in, in ESP, when we are working, currently we've reached uh, like the research using machine learning to uh, predetect the failure of the ESP before it happens. So Perfect. Uh, com combining that with the LLM model would give an uh, amazing advantage. Exactly. Tremendous. Amazing optimization. Great. Thank you, man. Thank you for yeah. the note. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions, any comments, concerns? I would more than welcome to talk or uh, read. Uh, Chief, I want to add uh, one comment, please. Yes, um, that's good. I, I just say uh, some words about the tool ops that we used in Wix Gona 1. Uh, this tool ops have many loops, like arrow B loops, uh, loop, uh, why not, why not, uh, wait on bit loops, others. Uh, if we see it, the ROB loops, the software will will run the weight on bit and RPM and flow rate uh, automatically, and we put some limitation on the <laughs> flow rate on weight on bit. You know, we have uh, MWD tools, so we work on limitation of pressure and uh, flow rate and weight on bit. So. And uh, this software will help us to to fast the section, and also we have 
sensors uh, on the floor line, uh, especially in the vulnerable. So uh, we detect any problem in, in the beginning. So we, we can solve it easily. And sometimes no, we, we, we even the software gives you alarm that the pressure is increasing or the floor is, the, there's some problem, the floor it decrease or increase. So sometimes we cannot fix the problem immediately even we use the software. So this yeah. depends on the company man or this DSV who work in, who, who, what his experience in this field. So th that's my comment. Uh, excellent point, Mr. Riyad. Uh, uh, what you said is right. Sometimes things are beyond our control. Let me just add a small nugget information for you. Just a comment on what you said. Um, a lot of companies, and um, this is probably not very close to what you're saying, but let me give you an ex example. Uh, you have cementing trucks coming on the rig site, right? You have and so many other units that come into picture. Cementing trucks obviously go through a proper maintenance a cycle, and they are to be maintained, cleaned up properly, so that when you're pumping cement, they are of good use. Uh, many companies nowadays are using data science technology not technology, I would say, data science algorithms to look at what kind of failures are happening on the cementing unit, study those failures, analyze and categorize those failures and perform the relevant uh, preventive maintenance on that. So now, if you know that one particular O-ring always bur uh, bursts out during operations, and that's a common thing, and that O-ring was never replaced in preventive maintenance because that was not part. Preventive maintenance is oiling and making sure everything is working good. People will change that O-ring or people will find a way to, to get a better O-ring so that they don't, the O-ring might be expensive, but the amount of money they are, uh, they, they are wasting on waiting on operation to fix that O-ring during the operation is much less. So they would just change that O-ring. So uh, what you just said, forecasting or sometimes things are out of our control. That is also a challenge. So I'm saying, why challenge yourself? What can I do to to um, to find out when will this flow line get uh, get choked up, or I need to clean that flow line? See if you can find a trend on it. Get get a data analysis on it. How often do you clean it? What do you see in it? How much percentage is clogged in it? H how do you clean it? By the end, you may come up with saying that you know what, just drill some holes, put few. Uh, injector lines in it and just clean it every three days and you're good. You will never have to do anything else. Your flow line will always be clean. Yes, you are right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Yad. Any other questions? Uh, I know we have been, I've been talking for like one hour and 20 minutes. So, uh, and it's late for you guys, I guess. Thank you. Thank you a lot, uh, Mr. Aman Srivastava. I think we can uh, finish here right now as nobody uh, have a question. And uh, I want to thank you again for this uh, amazing lecture, actually. Uh, and we hope uh, uh, in the future we'll make uh, more lectures like this with you. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you.